Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Um, this is Global Connections, uh, and we have with us uh, Michael C. Davis. That's Michael Curtis Davis, if you didn't know. And we're going to talk about the fourth anniversary of the movement in Hong Kong. We've been following that with him for years, and now here, are, here we are at the fourth anniversary. Not necessarily a happy time. Um, there is a map of Hong Kong, and we'll also show you a map of India. Uh, and the reason is that uh, Michael um, has an enormous biography. It would take us the, the whole show to, to go through all of it. But one of the things he does, he, he teaches at Jindal Global University uh, near New Delhi. Uh, he also is associated with the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. He's written uh, uh, dozens of books and articles about Hong Kong and other international issues. And he's testified in front of various um, governmental organizations looking into uh, human rights in uh, in Hong Kong and elsewhere, in the United States and elsewhere. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. So uh, let's um, let's talk about what this fourth anniversary means. The one thing that caught my eye is that in the past, the Tiananmen Square uh, uh, celebration memorialization in Hong Kong uh, had been going on every year because uh, people, uh, although you can't really uh, have a memorialization of that in in China, you, you know, you could in Hong Kong, and it was celebrated in, in Hong Kong for years and years, but this year they turned it off. And it's just a sign of the times, isn't it? Yes, and, and I mean, that's exactly four years ago when they did that, they started denying. At first, they were using COVID in 2020 to, to uh, allow, disallow this memorial. And I've been to many of them over the years because, I, as you know, I was a professor at the University of Hong Kong for many years. Uh, and uh, in fact, almost all of them I, I went to and it was very peaceful, no violence, no threat to anyone, uh, just memorializing, drawing attention to issues, which was what people do in regard to human rights. Uh, and now it's not allowed. They couldn't use COVID as an excuse this year. So they just, uh, I think pretty much they've decimated the, anybody who would protest because the organization that organized it is disbanded. And the, the leaders of that organization are in jail awaiting trial under the national security law. So, and there was no one else stepped up and asked to do it. Although there apparently some people who showed up on their own in Victoria Park in Hong Kong and, and uh, were arrested. Uh, so that's kind of where Hong Kong's at today. And you're right to draw attention to it because it's symbolic of what's happened to Hong Kong. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a sad story and, and uh, you and I have been talking about it, oh, Gosh, since the umbrella umbrella days, if you will. Yeah, um, 2014, 15 in those days, yeah. Yeah, that was a good time to leave. You left in, what, 2016, uh, thereabouts? Yeah, I well, I left, but I came back every year uh, under the Hong Kong uh, system, the retirement, mandatory retirement in 60, so I left then. Uh, but I came back, I kept coming back and, and, uh, until 2020. 2020, I could pull it off after the NSL was passed because I was uh, in New York and could teach my classes remotely. Uh, but I, I haven't been back to Hong Kong since. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of precarious to go back there uh, when you're speaking out on human rights issues. Uh, the human rights involvement is not much welcomed uh, today in Hong Kong. But you, the kind of things that involve promoting human rights could be treated as violating the national security law uh, and accuse you of collusion with foreign forces and all these sorts of things. Yeah, well, a couple of questions flow out of that. So you've been hither and yon in various uh, forum, fora, <laughs> and venues, whatnot, talking about the human rights, civil rights in Hong Kong. What is your message on it? Because, it, you know, it's it's not a happy story. It's uh, I guess it was predictable that uh, Xi Jinping and his friends uh, would would terminate uh, those rights, and they are and have. And uh, what can you say about it except the fact that they've been terminated? No, I think there's a lot to say. Actually, I got a new book coming out. <laughs> I just signed the contract on, but uh, so I say a lot about it. Uh, but uh, it's. You know, one thing, there's two levels ways to look at it. One is that promoting human rights, that's what you do. You draw attention to it, you keep publicizing it, 
Uh, and you, you'd like to believe that you're on the right side of history and that eventually uh, the concerns that you're raising will be addressed and the people that are violating human rights will be called uh, you know, out for it. Uh, but that's what human rights work is. You know, I teach my students that you have to speak up. It's mostly about publicizing. So publicizing that on its own is important. And it's done in, in, in a way to highlight a kind of broader concern in the world today, which we, we call a kind of illiberal turn that uh, hardline regimes like China are promoting a kind of illiberalism around the world. China's not like the Soviet Union that tried to promote some version of communism because China, Chinese regime, the Communist Party, isn't very communist anymore. Uh, rather, it tends to do trade and stuff with countries with poor human rights records and sort of educate them and encourage a kind of illiberal uh, systems of government where there's the structures and some of the institutions that look like democracy, uh, but they're all undermined in various ways. And so there's something to learn from Hong Kong beyond what we can do about Hong Kong to highlight that this is the sort of model that's being promoted and what the consequences are. Hong Kong went from one of the most vibrant, outspoken societies in the world to silence. Uh, and so that's something to be mindful of. It's something to warn governments when they get in bed with regimes that promote this version of government that this is what's happening. And it's a warning to the rest of us in the world, even in democracies, where populist leaders are promoting this, the same kind of illiberalism uh, that undermines the institutions that guard democracy. So, yeah, so there's an article by Tom Friedman, today's New York Times, yeah. um, where he talks he talks about domestic um, issues and he talks about Trump, of course. Um, but yeah. th that's exactly what he says. He says if you you want to deal with an autocrat or a would be autocrat, you've got to speak up, speak out. That's, that's the only antidote for it. And people don't do that enough. Uh, they are afraid. And it's a very exactly. interesting article. And it's reminiscent of Anne Applebaum, um, you know, years ago, I think it was in the Atlantic, where she um, gave an analysis of what happened in Eastern Europe after World War II, uh, where the communists wanted to take over all these countries and people were afraid. So they never spoke up. And that's what you're doing, speaking up and urging other people to speak up. You mentioned you had a book out or we're coming out with a book. It's not your first one on this. Can you talk about your array of books dealing with Hong Kong? Yeah, well, this what I the editors of the first book, which I, they showed at the beginning of our show today, the, the cover of it, because I want to show what protests look like, uh, asked me if I would now, because this was published right after the national security law was passed. And in there, I, I go through the history of many things in Hong Kong, but also highlight the threat posed by the national security law. Well, the editors then asked me to three years later to do an update where I look at whether these things actually happen. I'm sad to report in this book, I report in some detail just exactly how they do it. I mean, if you're in favor of authoritarianism, there's almost genius to what they're doing and how they manipulate all these institutions uh, because what they want to do is create the impression that they still are running one country, two systems in Hong Kong, an open society there, the rule of law. Uh, and so they maintain the facade or sort of structures that we see in democracy. And that's why I said a moment ago that this is an education for us all, because a lot of the countries that China does business with, where this kind of governance is encouraged, uh, have also the sort of architecture of democracy, pretense of democracy, courts, uh, re you know, judicial review and all these things that claims to the rule of law, but have degraded these institutions. So the title, the working title on this new book has been uh, Freedom Undone. Uh, be uh, of course, some reference to Hong Kong in that as well, but it's how do you undo freedom? How do you undo an open society? And so this becomes a kind of textbook study of how that is done and, and what was done and what the consequences are. So I think this is kind of what we're looking at. And this is where lessons are to be learned. And the point you made a moment ago, people are afraid to speak up and they're rightly afraid to speak up when they face jail or worse uh, in many societies. So that, that puts an obligation, which we all take on board 
when our country signed the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, when our countries uh, declare their support for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we take on board an obligation to speak up for people who cannot speak up for themselves. I find it very interesting that some of the things that China is doing and that you know, PRC is doing in Hong Kong sound like they are liberal, but it's false. Uh, they have programs that sound like they're really interested in helping people and all that, giving, giving, you know, I mean, I, I forget exactly what it was, but there are programs and events uh, that, that sound like they're really mm, um, um, helping people, but it's not true. Do, do you, did you cover that? Do you, you know, you know what I mean? Well, this is how authoritarian regimes, in effect, have to behave, especially in this case where they're pretending to carry out this one country, two systems model. The basic law that was uh, agreed to, I mean, it was agreed in a joint declaration which stipulated the content of this basic law. This basic law is hard to read it as promising anything other than an open liberal society with the rule of law, because all the things that are instrumental to that are guaranteed. In that now the national security law comes along in article four says it's going to maintain those commitments, but then it's going to protect national security Well, who's the threat to national security. Uh, in China, the biggest threat to national security is the Chinese people themselves in Hong Kong, they presume that's the case as well. Uh, and so uh, that's how it, it works. And, and, and it's what we're seeing is they will pretend to do all these things uh, that are still there because that's the basis for keeping Hong Kong, Hong Kong uh, and not making it China. Today, I was interviewed by someone from The Wire just asking me uh, whether Hong Kong is, uh, you know, I called my book was Making Hong Kong China. How far have they gone on that road? And that's that's sort of the tension here, you know. In one country, two systems, it was often stated that China was one country and the Hong Kong people were two systems. But uh, this is kind of the tension we're seeing. And, and unfortunately, it's not just in Hong Kong because of, of the sort of global promotion of this kind of governance where these kinds of leaders who think they know better than everyone else uh, are promoting their version of governance and countries uh, in, in de that are democracies are having to stand up against that or not, you know, and that's sort of what's, what's going on. Well, what she has done is a primer on how you, you know, uh, advance autocracy into a place that was not autocratic. And a, a lot of it is language, it's rhetoric, it's propaganda, it's lying to people, uh, it's creating um, what, what appears to be reasonable on the surface. And before you know it, uh, Jimmy Lai is spirited off to, to a prison. Um, right. And so, uh, you know, what, what you have is kind of a mind, um, it, um, it's, um, having to do with your mind, where you, you are told one thing, but the reality is another thing. And as you said a minute ago, it's brilliant. And my, my question, we talked about this before the show, is where does this brilliance come from? Is this Xi Jinping? Is it his brilliance? Is, is he really the one? Or is he um, surrounded with others um, that are the ones who come up with these programs? Well, I think when it comes down to Xi Jinping, it's interesting with Father's Day uh, on the horizon here, there's a piece by one of my friends uh, in the Washington Post talking about why Xi Jinping isn't more like his father, who was more of a, a kind of gone through uh, being sent to the countryside where Xi Jinping himself was as, as a child, young man, and, and then uh, eventually being rehabilitated, as they say, during the Maoist era, and promoting more liberal ideas and free press and so on. Well, it seems that Xi's lesson was that if you want to survive under communist regime, you have to be tougher than everyone else. Not, you have to be more like Mao, not like his dad. So maybe the lesson he learned uh, was to not be like his dad. Uh, and uh, and he, I think his idea is that, that they believe for reasons hard to explain, that the Communist Party is essential to China, that uh, the country depends on it, that without it, there would be chaos. And that if you want to maintain the rule of the Communist Party, you have to block uh, any kind of tendency towards liberalism, liberal, liberalizing the system uh, towards democracy. So these ideas are the primary threat. 
and Hong Kong was, you know, uh, grand central for these ideas. Uh, and so I think the idea became after the protest in 2019 that we have to shut this down. The Communist Party is threatened more than anything else by ideas. That that is, they, and they've issued documents on this back. I think in 2013, document number nine forbids even teaching constitutionalism, separation of powers, Western notions of democracy. And she has woven that same idea to block these things into his recent speeches and policy statements. And is then he, is it she, he or does he have a little cabal around him? Well, I think it's mostly him. I think he's very much in charge of it. And, and he articulates a very broad notion of, of national security such that under this version, it's a whole society version of national security. Anything, everything involves national security. And so Hong Kong, the national security law isn't just arresting Jimmy Lai or the 47 politicians that had the audacity to have a primary election, but it's, a re it's basically stopping these ideas on all fronts, uh, intimidating the press to not uh, promote these kinds of ideas. It's uh, re-educating the youth, teaching national security all the way down to kindergarten level. And so over these years since the national security law was imposed on Hong Kong, uh, its reach has gone to all of society and people ignore that at their peril. Well, you know, we talked years ago, and maybe, you know, we were looking into the future at the time, that, that what happened, what is happening, what has happened in Hong Kong uh, also somehow um, advances uh, Xi's interest, um, willingness, uh, power um, to try to take over Taiwan. Uh, how, how, is, how is that happening? Is, it, is that happening? Has what he has done in Hong Kong um, affected his ability to take over Taiwan? It, well, it, this is an interesting question because one of the things about the one country, two systems model that it was primarily designed for Taiwan to let Taiwan rejoin uh, Beijing as part of uh, the People's Republic uh, and yet have this high degree of autonomy uh, in its own system uh, and so on. And then when people and then Hong Kong became a sort of execution of that, maybe as a model. See how well things are in Hong Kong. Well, of course, people in Taiwan weren't, haven't been impressed lately with how well things are going in Hong Kong. Uh, and so that means that uh, this, the idea that Taiwan people would accept this kind of model is just not going to happen. Uh, and so then that means how do you get back Taiwan? And Xi Jinping has a lot of political capital invested in that. I guess you have to be willing to use force. This is where Ukraine comes in, because uh, Putin has sort of taken the bull by the horns and tried to do just that. And we see how well that's going. And of course, she, while trying to pretend to be a, a peacemaker, is very much behind Putin and supportive of Putin. So uh, does that does the Ukraine situation and the Hong Kong situation signal anything to Xi Jinping? I guess, if anything, it, it signals Hong Kong may signal, well, we'll have to use force. And Ukraine may signal, well, maybe that won't work out so well. Uh, and so it kind of leaves it uh, with a high level of uncertainty at the moment, whether that risk uh, is approaching, whether an attempt to do a Ukraine in Taiwan is on the horizon or not. And I, a lot of people are speculating about this. You talk, you talk about uh, speaking, giving testimony, writing articles and books, um, speaking out on autocracy, speaking out on what happened, what is happening, has happened in Hong Kong. But you're not only talking to Hong Kong, because Hong Kong actually, in the reality of it, can't do that much. It's already that the, the train is, um, the train is um, on the track. It's, you know, it's, sure, it's hard to stop it. But you're <laughs> really talking to other places. You're talking to other places that could be victimized by autocrats that want to invade or you know undermine their democracy and i think that that becomes of global interest when you talk about the loss of human rights and civil rights in hong kong you're really sending a message everywhere um and suggesting that people must speak out 
if they are to prevent this from happening in their town, right? Right, and to, and to know what it looks like. What are the tools that are being used? And so this new book, I tried to weave some of that into it. I don't let it take over the book, but I do try to point out that this is not just a Hong Kong problem. And I think a lot of the Hong Kong activists in exile now are very conscious of this, that they've, they've been seen out working with Ukrainians. They've been seen uh, uh, interacting with people in Taiwan, uh, interacting with Uyghurs, Tibetans. There's a, I think now in the old days when Hong Kong was sort of hived off from the other or worst cases, uh, there was some reluctance to engage these other groups because they didn't want to bring the, you know, the fury of Beijing down on their heads. But now that's sort of taken off the table. So in exile, a lot of them do uh, work together and they go to various parts of Europe and elsewhere, elsewhere where they can go safely uh, and, and they, they promote democracy. Uh, so the diaspora of Hong Kong, while Hong Kong has been silenced, uh, these conditions have brought light to the exile community of Hong Kongers. Yeah, right. Uh, <clears throat> and I suppose that's still happening. People are leaving Hong Kong, go to Britain and elsewhere, just get out of the way. Am I right? Yeah, they're doing that in, in, in large numbers. And not just that. I mean, business is leaving. Just today, I read an interesting uh, commentary on even the Hong Kong dollar peg is under some degree of threat because if business community loses confidence in the system, then they start pulling their money out. And then you can degrade the Hong Kong dollar, but because it's pegged, that means Hong Kong has to use US dollars to buy back Hong Kong dollars. And they've apparently over the past year used a lot. So there are sort of barometers, if you will, that, uh, tell us how successful Beijing is doing in convincing people that all is well in Hong Kong. And apparently it's not doing a very good job. Well, we, you know, we had before a very vital business community. Everyone saw Hong Kong as an international business center. Um, and I wonder, you know, how this has uh, affected that business center, the vi not only the vitality of it, but the uh, appeal of it to, to the International Financial Community, for example, and whether um, whether he is um, trying to under, undermine that actively in favor of Shanghai. Uh, can you talk about that? I think they, you know, of course, they've tried their best over the years to build up the Shanghai stock market and, and to try to make Shanghai more of a base so they don't put all their eggs in one basket, as it were. But Hong Kong has still stood the, its ground and over the many years until recently uh, because of its rule of law and basic freedoms. Uh, I mean, just this week, they, they tried to go to court and get an injunction against uh, the, you know, Google and everyone else, uh, Twitter, you name it, Facebook, for having the song Glory to Hong Kong on their websites to make this to get an injunction against it so that you're held in contempt of court if you do it. But the court at least at first said, well, you guys got to go back and name some defendants who you're trying to enjoin. You can't just enjoin the world. Uh, and so it's on a hold, held back for a while. I don't think that's necessarily a signal the court is out to protect uh, free speech on the internet, but merely that it wants to have a solid case if it's going to restrain uh, you know, the, this thing. What happened is that this Glory to Hong Kong, which was invented in 2019 during the protest as a Hong Kong anthem, and Hong Kong never really had its own anthem before it used to have the British one. Now the Chinese wanted to have the Chinese one. Uh, but the Hong Kong people in their hearts have this Glory to Hong Kong. Well, apparently, when they go play in sporting events around the world, these hosts have been playing this, thinking it was the Hong Kong anthem. And so the police in Hong Kong are going after athletes and athletic organizations for failing <laughs> to police this and make sure the right anthem is played. So now if the government wants to prove its loyalty to Beijing, it's actually gone to court to get an injunction against glory to Hong Kong. Uh, and so I would think this would just make people want to play it more uh, and I guess if they're not in Hong Kong, they probably will. 
but, but uh, nonetheless, this injunction, we'll see if it's granted. I guess it goes back to court in July after uh, it failed in its first attempt because they didn't name any defendants. They just wanted the whole world to be enjoined. Oh, you know, they're not done. You know, this is this right. is part of and, a long, yeah. I mean, it's the news story of the week because the, the speculation is, uh, is this the first step in imposing China's great firewall? Hong Kong. You know, if anything, now, after the degrading uh, liberal institutions, Hong Kong still stands out from the rest of China because you can go to Hong Kong and turn on CNN and the BBC and, and uh, you can Google on Google. You know, there's no Google in China. Uh, you can uh, do all these things on Facebook. Uh, but now it seems that this, this is this the question being, is this the first step? to start uh, closing down the free internet in Hong Kong? Uh, is the firewall next? Uh, of course, we don't know the answer to any of that at this point. Well, you know, back when in the days of the umbrella movement, say 2019 or so, um, Hong Kong was on the front page over and over and over again. Um, all those crowds, um, all the protests, it was, was really quite something. And yeah. since then, though, we've had a lot of other news and, um, you know, domestic politics and uh, Trump and the insurrection, what have you, the trouble in Congress and the Supreme Court in this country have, have sucked all the oxygen out of, out of the headlines. And uh, Ukraine, of course, is only a year and change old. It's uh, sucked a lot of oxygen out of the headlines. And so you don't see Hong Kong on the headlines nearly as much. Um, so, you know, kudos to you, Michael, for keeping the torch alive. But fact is that major media in the world don't cover it as much as possible. And it strikes me um, that works in Xi's favor because he can operate under the radar that way. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. And, and so this has always been the challenge for human rights work. Uh, during intense moments, uh, it's we get all the news media showing up. I was doing serial interviews during the umbrella movement. I was in Hong Kong then. Uh, but uh, even also during 2019 protests, there was, you know, even from overseas, I was doing a lot of that. And many of my friends were doing likewise. Uh, but now uh, it's not in the news. Many of these friends are in, in jail, actually, or in exile. Uh, and they're trying to draw attention to it. They get Congress to speak up from time to time. But without events on the ground, it's, it is hard to keep the world's uh, focus on, on issues like we're seeing in Hong Kong. But it, it is so important. I mean, you, when you think of Hong Kong, think New York, London, Paris. I'm in Paris right now. Actually, I noticed from your camera, I have a bit of a sunburn. Who thought I would get a sunburn in Paris? In any case, you, you, you think of these big major cities, Hong Kong is one of them. So these are centers of culture, centers of information, centers of business, of finance, of just about all the things we value in the world. And when you take one of them off the playing field, it should be a news event. It's something that we should try our best to pay attention to. Well, I want to you know, two things. One is, uh, Paris, thank you for joining us at night from Paris. Uh, from your, yeah, not the Spanish side. <laughs> this after it is right now 9 30 and this bright sun is brightly shining out there <laughs> how how do the french see all of this uh, i mean are you in in your travels to paris are you talking speaking writing about these issues and what kind of response do you get from the french they understand you know freedom they understand right of expression Millions of them come out in the street over issues that I'm afraid I, I would not go in the street for. But, you know, they feel they have the right, in fact, the obligation to express right. themselves. Um, how do they respond to what's happening in Hong Kong? Well, it seems like it's a very much a side issue. Macron, of course, and the French may be more than him, I, I would guess, uh, see China more in terms of business. So there's a slight tension uh, with the U.S. sort of hardline on China right now here in Paris that that uh, Macron was, uh, I guess he was in, in Beijing recently, uh, and he's trying to keep promote business. So uh, how do you thread that needle so that you promote business with China and still speak up about these issues? And I think that the French leadership is having a hard time uh, threading that needle. 
Yeah, that's an ill-advised trip for my money. Uh, in any event, um, the other thing I was going to ask you is this. What, here we are in 2023. It's been mm, five years plus since this all started to degrade, I mean, actively degrade in Hong Kong. And the question is, where do we go from here? Is, 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 uh, is it that uh, what in Jean-Paul Sartre, is the game up? Les jeux sont faits? Um, or is there more to come? Well, I wouldn't underestimate Hong Kong. Uh, they thought the game was up in 2014 and 15 uh, when the umbrella movement collapsed. And then 2019 came along. Well, before the umbrella movement, there was the 2003 Article 23 protest. You know, you and I talked about that, that as well. Uh, so we go back a long way. That was 2003 and the, the half a million protesters on the street. 2004 again, 2012 national education movement because of brainwashing in schools, um, attempts by Beijing. And so Hong Kong has bounced back more than once. Right now it does look tough. I mean, because uh, they, they've taken away the pretense that they're carrying out these basic freedoms and giving the court reign and, and the people reign to defend their freedoms. So it, it, it does look pretty hopeless to a lot of people, but that I'm still not willing to count them out. Uh, you know, things change and people, suddenly things that we don't imagine happen. We don't know where China's gonna be in 10 years time. Uh, so that's a really good point. Everything changes, the dynamic is global. That's right. And so we have, uh, and this, this is influenced by things way beyond Hong Kong, and it is influenced by the continuing uh, determination of people from Hong Kong and around the world to fight for democracy, to fight for the guarding of liberal institutions. We're not talking global liberal economy. We're talking liberal constitutional institutions that Americans know well. Uh, and guarding those uh, has become more and more of an imperative, and whether that will, uh, Hong Kong will become part of that story in the future, we'll have to stay tuned. Well, it's a flat and in, in interdependent world. We know that more every day. And so the question is, there are a lot of people that are not aware, not thinking about this, not hearing anything about this. What is your message to them? What, what kind of mindset should they have about the events that have happened that are happening in Hong Kong as it relates to, what do you want to call it? The, the, the global sea chain? I think it's, it's right at the front line of the global fight for democracy. So if you believe that there is a challenge to democracy, both in democracies, the populist leaders uh, that undermine liberal institutions, uh, separation of powers and free speech, rule of law, uh, if you believe that, if you believe that in countries like China, Russia, and many smaller ones have leaders who will not guard those institutions, who seek to undermine them, that, that the powerful countries like China offer economic advantage to those countries, then you realize that, and you just look at home in your own mirror of what's going on, and you'll see what's happening in Hong Kong is very relevant to, to the world at large. And so guarding Freedom anywhere is guarding it everywhere. Oh, wow. Thank you very much, Michael. Michael Davis, a professor and author, a member of the Woodrow Wilson Institute and so many things. Thank you for your contribution um, to, what do you want to say, global thought about basic freedoms. Thank you so much. Thank you. I always appreciate talking in Hawaii, even when I can't be there. <laughs> <laughs> Au revoir, à bientôt. Yes. <laughs>Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.